we've worked very closely and, and very fruitfully in cooperation with that office. We're very grateful to Nils and as well as his deputy, Jimmy, Ambassador Jimmy Coker, his chief of staff, Katie Kampf, and, and others in that, in that very important office. Um, in his role, he is the um, uh, senior representative, the U.S. representative to the World Health Organization's executive board. He's the principal liaison uh, with health ministries uh, around the world. Uh, he is a uh, senior, uh, the, the senior most advisor to Secretary Sebelius on global health issues, and of course we know she has uh, uh, played an important role in, 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 uh, in blessing the first uh, global health strategy that was issued uh, in the first admi Obama administration and in her own travels uh, to um, Vietnam and Thailand in the summer. Uh, prior to taking on this role, uh, Nils, for 10 years, was the president CEO uh, of the Global Health Council, and we're happy to see today Christine Sao uh, here, the new executive secretary of the Global Health Council, as well as Jono uh, uh, Mann, the, uh, uh, the uh, chairman of the board. Um, the, um, uh, prior uh, to, the, to that position, uh, Nils was the deputy assistant secretary in the, in the Bureau of Health, uh, in the uh, uh, Carter administration, in the Clinton administration, and uh, in that role, uh, really elevated USAID's um, voice and impact uh, there. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Niels uh, today as our keynote speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's nice to be among friends. Uh, a lot of very familiar faces here of people I've worked with for, in some cases, decades. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to talk briefly uh, about universal health coverage as a construct, uh, as a reality, uh, in the context of some of the international discussions uh, that are taking place, as well as in the context of our own uh, domestic uh, policies and policy debates. Um, I will frame some things from my vantage point as someone who spent uh, close to three decades in international development before moving into a domestic health agency. Um, and also uh, leave, try to leave uh, room and space for comments and uh, dialogue uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of this session. Universal health coverage uh, is, I believe, one of the key uh, health, public health challenges and opportunities of our time. It's also an area in which there is broad agreement. Uh, as many of you know, I frequently travel uh, around the world representing Secretary Sebelius, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the U.S. government in a range of uh, health uh, discussions and negotiations with other ministries of health. And while there are many topics on which health leaders around the world do not agree, and we get to fight about those all the time, um, there is no question but that universal health coverage is a common goal, a common mission, an area uh, in which when Secretary Sebelius goes to China and they have debates about trade agreements and debates about uh, uh, defense uh, uh, alignments and debates about uh, uh, currency, uh, there is a very strong similarity in terms of views about the importance of providing uh, accessible, uh, effective, quality health care to all of the citizens and looking for ways in which we can share experiences and approaches in a constructive way. So. From the global health diplomacy standpoint, universal health coverage is a, uh, both an effective and a very meaningful tool uh, for international dialogue. As Dr. Margaret Chan uh, has said repeatedly, uh, universal health coverage is the single most important concept that public health has to offer. It's the best way to cement the health gains made during this previous decade it's a powerful social equalizer and the ultimate expression of fairness. Now, universal health coverage is not just a matter of having someone, government, 
third party insurers pay for services. It is a systemic construct unique to each society that is aimed at better and more equitable health outcomes across all strata of society. It's both a technical agenda and a social justice agenda. And maintaining a balance of these two drivers is vitally important to the success, the ultimate success of the uh, universal health coverage movement. We have a counterpoint on that, and I have friends here in this room who are well familiar with that counterpoint, uh, which was the declaration made 35 and a half years ago in Alma-Ata um, that posited a, a goal of health for all by the year 2000. Health for all was very largely a social justice construct, but um, it did lack some of the substantive technical um, underpinnings uh, that would turn it into uh, useful programmatic uh, achievements. And because of that, uh, while I think it had a very important impact in terms of international mobilization, and the echoes of Health for All still uh, are heard loud and clear in uh, debates on, on health care, uh, it was not an agenda that I think any of us can say succeeded in the way that, um, uh, that many of us had hoped. You have to have that balance of the technical and the social justice. And so when I look at the substantive aspects of universal health coverage, I view it through a variety of lenses that have to be, in a sense, overlaid in order uh, to really get to the uh, end point that uh, I think we, uh, we all share. Um, the top layer is a layer of coverage. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that people have access. Uh, but uh, access by itself doesn't do it in terms of uh, real public health impact, in terms of health outcomes. Uh, we have to have efficiency. Uh, because without efficiency, we will spend ourselves into bankruptcy, as the United States has effectively shown. Um, and we also uh, have to have uh, a focus on quality of care, because uh, uh, accessible and efficient health services that uh, provide lousy services uh, are not likely to make uh, a meaningful impact on people's lives. <clears throat> and finally, in, in my construct, um, it's not just about those elements, but it's also about the active uh, engagement and interface between the health provider uh, and the patient or the client or whatever uh, name you want to give that person for true choice uh, and joint decision making, uh, not the top-down medical construct that uh, uh, so often is seen in healthcare systems uh, in which uh, the doctor decides and uh, the patient is expected, often unreasonably, to simply follow through with that, and very often um, uh, to the detriment of the healthcare of that person. So the issue of uh, meaningful engagement uh, and uh, joint decision-making uh, is, in my view, a very important aspect in the long run of whether universal health coverage uh, is going to really have the impact that we're talking about. Now, UHC is uh, especially important now as we look to address the new geography of global poverty. And uh, I'm pleased to see my friend Ariel Pablo Mendez here, who speaks to this uh, uh, with, uh, with great expertise, and he may already have done so, in which case I, I apologize for repeating something he may have said, but I wasn't here this morning. Uh, as I said, I've spent three decades working on issues of health care and equity in developing countries. Um, and like many of us in this room uh, who have done similar work, uh, we did so in a world where poor people lived in low-income countries. This is no longer our global reality. Two decades ago, uh, nine out of 10 of the world's poor, nine out of 10 of the world's poor population lived in low-income countries. Today, nearly three out of four of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. 
Governments are coping with the reality that while average incomes are rising, many of their citizens remain impoverished. Access to affordable care is critical if governments are to address this internal economic and frankly social disparity. Pulling people out of poverty requires a system-wide approach to achieve population-wide gains and also importantly a, an effective safety net to prevent medical impoverishment. Universal health coverage can serve as that unifying element, serving as a potential umbrella by which to achieve population-wide health gains. This is why I believe that universal health coverage is a fundamental topic for the post-2015 development agenda discussion. The change in the geography of poverty is resulting in a shift away from the traditional development model of uh, health assistance. When the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were created, they were created in the context of a world where the poor were in low-income countries. As the world comes together to create the post-MDG goals, we are, in fact, looking at a very different picture and are still struggling with how we can best accommodate to the new global realities in a way that remains true to our fundamental commitments to improved health and health equity. Middle-income countries no longer need traditional development agencies to build roads, to send uh, health care providers, uh, or provide medicine. Rather, what we see uh, at HHS in terms of our uh, interactions with our sister health ministries around the world is that countries are increasingly seeking technical collaboration to help them build better systems for themselves to address domestic needs. This is not to say that they no longer uh, need resources. Uh, resources continue to be a big challenge and I know that this is a topic uh, that is uh, very ripe in terms of the discussion of what the role of development assistance is in universal health coverage. But in fact, what we see is very often what countries are asking us for is know-how, um, operational expertise in terms of uh, a wide range of uh, health programs and policies and procedures. Uh, so that they can uh, have the opportunity to build it themselves in the context uh, that's most appropriate to them. For that reason, I think that universal health coverage really will help to define the future of global health in which countries are creating and investing in their own health systems and becoming more self-reliant as social protection structures become more efficient. And the challenge, I think, for uh, traditional development assistance is finding ways in which to provide that assistance in uh, effective leveraging contexts um, to help to catalyze that change uh, without um, building further dependency uh, or distortions into the uh, domestic systems. Now, as for the post-2015 goals, I don't know whether universal health coverage will be the official overarching goal, um, and the U.S. has not as yet established a firm position on this because there's a lot of discussion and uh, dialogue going on. But as disease burden is more and more a key marker of inequity, and wellness is the ultimate equalizer, universal health coverage may well be the most powerful tool uh, as well as uh, mobilizer that we do have. I do know that, as I said, that uh, there's considerable debate uh, as to how much of the UHC agenda can be driven and supported by the international community and to what degree it needs to be homegrown. And uh, I'd look forward to comments and discussion about this uh, later on in the session. But as I said, this is no longer a, an issue of the poor versus the affluent, them versus us. Um, we're very much facing uh, the issue of universal health coverage 
right here uh, in the United States. You may have heard of the Affordable Care Act. I'll refer you to our website later. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, clearly, the U.S. has demonstrated that um, uh, universal health coverage is, in fact, a universal issue. Um, just as we are a clear example, as the United States is a clear example of how putting more and more money uh, into health care does not necessarily result in better health care outcomes or more equitable health care. Uh, and uh, I'll talk briefly about our domestic situation because uh, it is really a global uh, arena in which we're operating now. As I said, um, uh, after spending uh, several decades working in international development, I've now spent the last four years uh, in a domestic health agency, uh, and therefore, uh, by the logic of Washington, I am a clear expert on U.S. domestic health care. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the journey that's taken place uh, here in the U.S. In our country, we now spend $2.8 trillion each year on health care, uh, which is far more per capita than any other nation. Uh, this represents nearly one in every five dollars used in our economy, a level, a proportion nearly twice that of our nearest, I hesitate to use the word, competitor. Uh, but as everyone in this room knows, uh, this has not made us healthier, and in fact, it has also not made us more competitive in the international arena. It's just helping us to spend more and more in an apparently endless spiral. Part of our problem has been uneven access to care, especially preventive services. We live in a country with some of the best clinical specialists in the world, and yet many Americans not only do not have access to those specialists once they are sick, but they cannot even access basic preventive services to keep them from getting sick. As I said, wellness is the great equalizer and our health system has generally ignored this vital issue. In addition, we see that the health system as we have constructed it here in this country <clears throat> devotes a, an extraordinary level of resources to end-of-life care. It's estimated that 40% of health care spending uh, is spent in the last three months of a person's life. Now, in some instances, those resources are well spent uh, and make a huge difference for the person and for the family and for the community and, if I can say so, even for society. But in many cases, it's driven by uh, medical uh, technology and what is possible to be done uh, rather than what is desirable to be done. And when I mentioned earlier the issue of uh, patient choice and uh, patient provider dialogue and interaction. One of the things that um, we've seen is that in circumstances in which uh, there is a well-articulated interface and dialogue between uh, the provider and the patient, and the patient is empowered to make thoughtful choices and given the information uh, that she or he needs in terms of uh, prospects of various outcomes, in a very large proportion of cases, uh, they choose the less technological heavy and certainly the far less expensive approaches which give them uh, the opportunity to have time with their families, uh, to have the dignity of being at home. Uh, and uh, this makes a huge difference in terms of social outcome, even if it doesn't result in uh, greater lifespan. Uh, and of course, has the potential uh, to make a huge difference in terms of healthcare expenditures. So these things are issues that we're learning here domestically, uh, that we're working on very actively in the context of the Affordable Care Act uh, in uh, trying to rationalize um, and humanize the healthcare system. Uh, and those are areas in which I think we have things to offer, not as solutions, uh, but rather as a dialogue with partner countries uh, who are beginning to uh, face and encounter the same sets of issues. There are, of course, 
two major obstacles that we always talk about, uh, cost or affordability, and uh, complexity uh, or accessibility. Um, and again, I mentioned some of the problems that are well known about the, uh, the, uh, 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 the healthcare website, uh, which became too complex for people to use even when it was operating right. We're simplifying it, we're trying to make it more, uh, more s oriented towards the user uh, rather than towards the developer and the engineer. But you look at where we are today compared to uh, five years ago. Uh, when I joined the Obama administration, 50 million Americans were without any health care coverage. Since the passage of the Affordable Care Act and the opening of the marketplaces, which allows people to sign up for affordable quality health care, according to the latest figures, uh, nine million more people now have the security and peace of mind of health insurance. Uh, that's not just people who've signed up through the marketplaces, but the expansion of Medicaid, uh, the availability of uh, health insurance for uh, young people under their parents' uh, policies, uh, and other mechanisms. In the broader context of universal health coverage, the Affordable Care Act is not only about access. It's about new rights and protections, and that's the social justice side of uh, the equation. No one can any longer be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, pregnancy, or prior cancer. No woman can be charged more for coverage simply because she is a woman. No longer will annual limits be allowed, allowing coverage to run out just when people need them the most, leading to medical impoverishment. And no one will uh, again have to worry about going without health coverage when they lose their jobs. Uh, one of the benefits that we look towards in the not distant future uh, from this growing flexibility in terms of health coverage will be, in fact, a more flexible and mobile workforce who are not chained uh, to a uh, job and position that does not suit them uh, simply because they fear the loss of their health coverage. And this could, in fact, uh, result in uh, new entrepreneurship, uh, new flexibility within the economy that could uh, uh, demonstrate itself in real hard economic growth terms. Uh, that's uh, still a conjecture, uh, but I think there's uh, solid reason to believe that it, uh, uh, it is on the way. So, as I said, in our international travels, uh, Secretary Sebelius and I have found that this topic, probably more than any other, has been a regular feature of discussions with uh, healthcare leaders from other countries uh, at the World Health Organization and um, also at the uh, WHO Executive Board where I've uh, served as the representative. In these conversations, it's been very clear uh, that there's no one-size-fits-all model. Uh, there is an infinite variety of, um, of important dynamics that go on within uh, the political, economic, and social structure of uh, each country. Uh, there's a huge variety in terms of capacity to meet, meet a, a range of needs, but the overall uh, construct has really become very clear that uh, as a common goal, universal health coverage uh, is, uh, is well recognized and desirable. Um, as I said, around the world, countries have successfully taken a range of approaches to healthcare coverage in regards to services, to cost sharing, financing, and organization. All of them have their particular advantages and each has unique shortcomings. We have a responsibility to share both the advantages and shortcomings in a very honest and transparent way so that we can learn from each other so that we can modify and improve our various systems, not with the aim of coming together in a single unified system around the world, but rather uh, being able to better tailor uh, the systems that we are each building. But while it is the responsibility of individual governments and their people to decide how each will make health coverage a reality, 
It is, in fact, our shared burden and shared responsibility to work towards these goals. The World Health Organization also has a critical leadership role to play, and one that they have assumed under Margaret Chan's leadership, both in advocacy as well as in technical support. Last year, the United States co-sponsored a World Health Assembly resolution on developing health workforce by promoting workforce education to meet the needs of universal health coverage. And next week, I'll be in Geneva for the executive board meeting to discuss a new resolution on health intervention and health technology assessment in the context of universal health coverage. This resolution, in many ways, gets to the heart of what we're discussing here today, how to design a health system that not only provides access to necessary services and interventions, but that does so in a rational, sustainable, and patient-centered way. While there's much enthusiasm around universal health coverage, uh, there is a great deal to be done, and there's no clear or easy path. Uh, this is an iterative process. But it's certainly far from being an impossible road. The progress that we've shown here in the US over the past five years and in countries around the world over the past decade or more uh, make that very clear. Uh, we're really in a very different context today than we were at the time of the launching of the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000. President Obama reminds us that access to health care is not some earned privilege, it is a right. And quoting President Obama at the World Health Assembly um, has been a real delight because for many years uh, the United States uh, refused to use the word health and right in the same sentence. Um, it's very hard to disagree with your president, so I'm very pleased to be able to quote him in that context. Our work means that the generations to come will have the opportunity to live happier and healthier lives. And as a son, as a husband, as a parent, and recently as a grandparent, that could not please me more. Thank you very much. Okay, what works association? How do you see uh, PEPFAR evolving under a, universal, a, a move toward universal uh, insurance coverage? Thank you. Uh, do we have another hand over here? Yeah, right here. Hi, Niels. Paul Shaper with Merck. Um, more broadly than PEPFAR, what do you see the um, change within the development aid for health architecture of the U.S. with a move toward uh, universal health care? Uh, Jill, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer your question um, in terms of uh, uh, the impact of uh, universal health coverage on PEPFAR. Um, certainly PEPFAR um, has been 
increasingly integrated uh, into conversations that take place across the government, and Ariel uh, can attest to that. In terms of uh, maintaining the, the legal, the legislative focus on uh, care treatment and prevention of uh, people with or at risk of HIV and AIDS, but also recognizing the importance of integrating uh, that whole program of services and approaches into a broader health systems context. I think that's going to be uh, a uh, significant challenge, uh, and I mean that in a positive way, uh, for uh, the incoming uh, uh, global, uh, global AIDS coordinator, uh, Dr. Debbie Burks, who's uh, just been nominated by the president. Um, and I think what we're all looking for is ways in which uh, PEPFAR will, and it's already started this, will transition out of an emergency response into a sustained response, and that cannot be done uh, without being uh, deeply engaged in uh, health systems and health systems development uh, along the channels that I've been talking about. There are a number of countries where uh, PEPFAR is working now uh, to develop um, agreements with the countries uh, in which uh, greater responsibility and direction and leadership is taken by the, uh, by the, the country, uh, national authorities themselves. Um, and I think it's early on in the process, but I think the interaction between PEPFAR, uh, USAID, uh, and uh, parts of, of my department is probably uh, a, a useful uh, development, and we're seeing similar kinds of developments uh, within the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. Uh, Paul, uh, I will take a shot at uh, the, the uh, development aid architecture, but I will also invite my friend Ariel uh, to, to comment on that because we, we, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing the same elephant, but from, from uh, different angles in, in this context. Um, as I said repeatedly today, I, I come to this position uh, from uh, really very much an international development perspective, because that's where I've devoted most of my working life. Um, and I think that USAID is a uh, vitally important part of the, uh, the, the, the global agenda in terms of both health and the, the broader development context. But I am seeing from this new perch um, a different side of things, which is uh, the, uh, the very deep uh, interest and respect that um, host governments, and particularly ministries of health, uh, have for, as they call us, their sister agency. Um, and uh, there's an enormous interest in working with um, CDC, NIH, the Food and Drug Administration, um, even domestic agencies within HHS, such as the Health Resources and Services Administration, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, basically to, to to, share, to get some of that shared experience and expertise. Uh, and uh, I have to say, this has been far from a one-way street. Uh, the people who I have met at HHS who started out being domestic health people and who got engaged through PEPFAR or other mechanisms in the international arena, um, a lot of them have stumbled. Um, we, we all know that international development is not simple and you have to have um, some uh, understanding of the complex dynamics of societies and cultures. You can't just apply what we do here in the U.S. Uh, but they've learned a great deal, uh, and I think that they've become better professionals uh, as a result. So I think what we're seeing is a, a shift, not a, not a transition, but a, a gradual shift into more and more of that technical collaboration between um, uh, similar parts of our governments, uh, but one in which, uh, particularly in the poorest countries where the more traditional development assistance continues to play uh, a very vital role in terms of providing the resources and the, the sort of the poverty orientation, which is different from the health technical orientation. Ariel, can you? Thank you, and that's indeed the heart of the matter, Paul. And that's why it's great that CSIS has convened this conversation. It's a more complex conversation. It's not a simple 
uh, issue to get right, and it's even less simple to communicate it well in Washington or to the American people. And yet, I think more and more people will understand that that's what's happening. The world is changing very fast. And PEFAR specifically has, I think, attempted to move from the first five years, which were we need to go in and save lives. There were not enough resources, and you came in with a vertical parallel system, but that accomplished the job. And in the second five years, PEFAR has been more nuanced indeed, more integrated building capacity. We in USAID have been doing a lot of that with the health systems work. And the next five years for PEFAR are gonna be more complex and challenging. The, the approaches will, will not work anymore because South Africa now can buy, can buy all their antiretroviral pills. And what does that mean? So as Niels alluded earlier in, in his presentation, what I've been calling the economic transition of health, growing domestic resources, not in all countries, but in most, and very fast means that we had to adjust and change. President Obama Global Health Initiative gave us all of the principles to deal with that complexity, but the budget realities had not followed, not only in amounts, but in the qualitative architecture that you are suggesting, not only to do the job of development well in this new space, but also to plant the seeds for the future. I tell Niels and I've told in many other places that as development succeeds, and it's succeeding widely around the world, all, I mean, all of this growth in economics and better governance and better health has been an incredible success for the last 20 years. We certainly hope at UCID, President Kennedy, we were funded to eventually to the ultimate day in which the countries can stand on their own from development assistance. But I tell Niels, the future then belongs to HHS and many of you in universities who work as grown-up partners with already countries like Brazil or Mexico or South Korea or Taiwan and so on and so forth. It's a different dynamic. We have not invested in that future very well. Today, PEFAR has a mandate. Uh, but there should be some budget for the office that Niels does to have health at the chest in more countries that can orchestrate the relationships with all of the other agencies and entities, public and private, in this country. We have to imagine that future now and begin to tee up, uh, and, and in the end, I've learned in Washington, budget talks. And so how the architecture of the budgets evolve will become very important. But all of us getting it right, communicating it right, will be important if we're going to be successful, because the longer it takes, we are missing opportunities uh, for the leadership that the US has played in the previous a paradigm and what it still has to play in the upcoming paradigm. And l let me just add one thing to that, uh, which is that the issues themselves that we're dealing with are also shifting in the, in the, uh, the dialogue globally. Whereas 30 years ago it was maternal and child health, um, uh, reproductive health, uh, infectious diseases, uh, what we're seeing, and I think everyone here is well aware, is a huge surge of non-communicable chronic diseases uh, around the world, uh, which of course is the, the issue that has uh, driven our healthcare costs here in the United States. When you look at non-communicable uh, diseases, uh, they are, uh, I, I call them, I, I actually say that they are, they are not non-communicable, they are socio-communicable diseases. Uh, they're driven by markets, by global trade, uh, uh, by economics, uh, by uh, urbanization, uh, by the changes that are going on in the world. And the response to those kinds of health issues uh, is qualitatively different than uh, child survival uh, or safe motherhood. Uh, in that very often it's national policies and importantly trade policies uh, that play a vital role in serving as the drivers. Uh, and so, you know, in, in our context, my office now has, uh, as I think you're well aware, one of uh, uh, my uh, deputies really focuses a great deal on the trade issues and the health aspects, whether that has to do with tobacco or uh, other uh, related topics that uh, are uh, fact, important factors in the emergence of non-communicable diseases. I think that's going to be a growing part of the international dialogue on uh, both universal health coverage and better health care. Thank you. Um, one quick observation and then a closing question for Nils. The observation is in listening to you talk about the case for universal health coverage and then talk about 
what's happening here in the United States. And then the unresolved question around is, what is the U.S. position heading towards the end of 2015 on the post-MDGs, and it's an unresolved issue. It did remind me that when we have in our country an uh, a, a health reform moving towards universal health coverage that has so deeply cleaved our country, and in which we have one party making the opposition to that, it's, it's, top, it's top priority heading into the 2014 cycle and perhaps the 2000. 16 cycle, and the reverse being the case uh, on the on the uh, Democratic Party versus the Republican Party, it it does create an enormous dissonance in trying to talk about what our position is on universal health coverage and on, on a global level, right? Because by taking that position, it's very hard to dissociate or distance the two the two phenomena. You have to somehow. Uh, walk and chew gum at the same time uh, around what we have as such a deep division around this within our own country, and we're trying to forge a consensus, as Ariel's pointed out, trying to forge a new consensus around what do we mean by universal health coverage globally. Um, and so, just to close, the question would be, Nils, you sit at that point of you, you sit on the edge of that, of that tension line, right? Because you're, you're the lead personality on the global issues at HHS, but you're part of HHS, so you are, you are deeply embedded within this enterprise, this historic enterprise that is underway in the United States. How do you foresee uh, dealing with, reconciling this dilemma in the next two years when we, we have now to, uh, 23 months or uh, plus before we get towards the conclusion of this. And the U.S. role in the deliberations around the post-MDGs is going to be critically important. Well, I'd, I'd say there are, there are two aspects to that. Uh, one is the domestic aspect, which, uh, as you note, is uh, uh, very conflictual. Um, I think ultimately the domestic side of this debate Will, um, will be determined by what happens, by the outcomes. Um, ultimately, the noise and the politics will be drowned out by the reality. And uh, it is our very strong belief and expectation, and certainly uh, our profound hope, uh, that the Affordable Care Act will have uh, sufficient and clear benefits to the American people that they'll say, oh yeah, this this works and let's get on with things. But, you know, that's, fortunately, I don't deal with the domestic politics of, of that, so I, I am spared uh, uh, that particular uh, bright flame. On the international side, uh, it's, it's very interesting. The, the you know, we, I meet, as I say, regularly with, with uh, colleagues and counterparts from around the world, and they just don't understand what all the fuss is about. Um, they, you know, they, they say, you know, of course everybody should have coverage. Why are you still fighting about this? Um, and uh, they are very uh, appreciative of uh, the efforts underway here. And uh, Secretary Sebelius is an is a absolute rock star internationally. Wherever she goes, they want to hear about uh, her efforts on, on uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, so, so it really hasn't gotten in the way of our, in fact, it's been a posit, net positive in terms of uh, our international uh, relationships and, and on, on the part of many of the, the countries that I deal with, the, the basic uh, response is, well, <laughs> thank goodness it's about time now we can sit politely in the same room and have the same conversation. Um, so that's made it easier. As far as the, the issues relating to the MDGs, I haven't yet seen the domestic uh, battles uh, come into that discussion. I'm hopeful that uh, they won't. Um, I'm not naive enough to be optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is an area where uh, we really need, I think, to, to maintain a focus on uh, I think what has been a very strong bipartisan, uh, nonpartisan effort uh, from uh, the United States uh, on healthcare improvement around the world, and, and that's certainly been uh, my effort. Thank you very much. Uh, we've reached the end of this part of our program, so please join me in thanking Assistant Secretary Dolaire.
we're going to move immediately into our next panel.